Welcome to part 6 in this series of tutorials on using AI tools. In this tutorial, we'll look at how AI tools work under the hood or under the bonnet if you're in the UK. And here's what we'll cover. So we'll begin by looking at how AI tools turn words or parts of words into numbers called tokens, and how they then use a concept called embedding to generate large matrices of numbers from this. What I then want to do is explain that AI tools are black boxes and that even if you have postgraduate degree in maths, you're still not going to understand what's going on from this point onwards. What I then want to do is explain some of the limitations of AI tools consequential to what you've learned so far. And then we'll have a look at two ways in which you can tweak your prompts. One is by tweaking something called temperature and the other is by tweaking something called the top P value. But that's enough of watching me. I'm going to vanish now and let's get started. So before we look at tokens, let's have a quick look at what an AI query involves. You get your input prompt. I'm going to use the example of writing a haiku about an owl. I really hope I'm pronouncing haiku correctly. What then happens is something called tokenization. It turns the text into numbers and we'll see that happening in a second. It then does something called embedding and turns that vector of numbers into a matrix. It submits that to what's called a large language model, which is based on vast amounts of training data and spits out the answer. So let's now have a look at tokens. You can go to this publicly available website on the OpenAI platform. I've included the URL with the video notes on our website and you can type in any text. So I'm going to say write a haiku about an owl. And you can see as I was typing that in, this colourful thing at the bottom was showing how that's represented as tokens. So you can see the word write consists of a single token, but haiku is divided up into two, one for the syllable hi and one for the syllable ku. But you can actually see the numbers involved. If you click on the token IDs tab, you can see what I, what I actually said in computer speak was 10930261 etc. So when you submit a query, to any AI, any AI tool, it's tokenized and converted to a stream of, to you, meaningless numbers. But that's just the beginning of the process. Let's look now at how embedding works. If you were to follow along, you would need firstly to sign up to the OpenAI platform. I've included that URL in the program notes. So you'd have to create an account and log in. And then you'd have to know a bit of Python or some other language. So what I've written is a program which will take any input text. And what it will do is give me the embedding for it. I'll explain what that means in a moment. So we said, write a haiku about an owl. So that's the text I'm going to input. So I'm going to run that program now and there will be a short delay. And what it's doing is taking that text and turning it into 15 1,536 numbers. That's significant because there were seven tokens in the original prompt and seven times 218 is 1,536. So for every single one of the seven tokens in the original prompt, it's generated 218 numbers. Here they all are corresponding to all the different parameters that the large language model requires in order to be able to work out how to treat the text submitted to generate predictive text output. And that, believe me, is as far as you or I or 99% of humanity will ever get in understanding how AI tools work. And to convince you of that, let's look at the mechanics of what goes on behind the scenes. There's a famous prayer called the Serenity Prayer, and this is the artificial intelligence version of it. Grant me the intellect to understand the things that make sense, the courage to ignore the things which don't, and the wisdom to tell the difference between the two. And what I want to do is grant you the wisdom to tell the difference between what you'll be able to understand and what you won't. I typed into an AI tool, please show a bulleted list of the mathematical concepts I'll need to know in order to be able to understand how large language models work. And this is what I got. Now, I've done a fair bit of maths and I certainly don't recognize over half these topics. 
but I thought I'd check it wasn't me being stupid, so I said, repeat this, but give the titles as they'd appear in a course and group them into three groups, school maths, undergraduate maths, and postgraduate maths. And that's what came back. So unless you're an expert in all the topics on this page, you are not going to be able to understand how large language models work. If you're still not convinced, here's a diagram taken from the Breakthrough 2017 paper explaining how the new concept of a transformer worked. And if you're still not convinced, there's a URL for the original paper. I've included it in the program notes. And you're very welcome to read down this and see if you can make sense of any of it. The reason I stress all this is because there's a lot of articles on the internet which claim to explain how the large language models work, but I have a strong suspicion they're written by people who don't know what they're talking about. At least I've got the virtue of honesty. I'm trying to tell you that you'll never understand it. So given what we know about how AI tools work, let's look at some of the limitations of them. There's four. One is that AI tools can and do hallucinate, and we've seen examples of that already. I have to be honest, I think with ChatGPT5, it's vanishingly rare, particularly if you ask your AI tool to quote its sources and to go to the latest version of websites, but maybe I'm just lucky. The second problem, which we'll look at in a second, is to do with data security, passing confidential data onto the likes of ChatGPT. And there's also possible problems with the size of the context window and with how good the underlying large language model actually is. So let's look at the last three in turn. So with data security, it's possible that you might be working on a top secret formula for how to extend people's lives. And you just check with ChatGPT, Chat here's my formula for working out how people can live to 200 years in perfect health. Can you just check it's okay? What will happen is that information will be used to train future versions of ChatGPT. And it's perfectly possible that somebody else can type in, how can I live until I'm 200 in the future and get in part or in whole your secret formula. Now, all of the AI tools recognize that this is a potential problem and they have something called temporary chat. So in ChatGPT, I could turn this on. I'm just gonna delete my offensive or dangerous prompt. I could turn that on and now you can see that anything I type in won't appear in history and it won't be used to update ChatGPT's memory or be used to train its models. So this is safe, but does mean that you won't be able to have a record of a conversation you've had and use it in the future. So another possible problem is the size of the context window in your AI tool. Imagine if you asked a question and by the end of the question, it had forgotten the beginning because it only had a certain memory. Well, it's unlikely to be a problem, and I'm going to prove that by typing in this prompt. Please produce a table showing the maximum context size in tokens for each of the following AI tools. And I'm going to get as a table with these four headings, AI tool name, version, context window limit, and output limit. And I'll have footnotes at the bottom giving, uh, citing the sources used to derive each figure. So if I run this now, then after a short pause, Six minutes, 52 seconds. I must have asked a difficult question. It kept going to different websites to get the information. But you can see it's given two columns. The context window limit is how many words you will be limited to when you ask the question. And the output limit is how many words the response will be limited to. And you can see the sort of number of words involved run into the many thousands. And what this means in English is it's extremely unlikely this is ever going to be a problem for you. But I just thought I'd mention it as a possible issue. What you could also do is to ask about the parameters. So this is saying, how good is the large language model? So what I'm going to do is to say, produce a table showing the number of parameters in the large language models used by the latest versions of each of the following AI tools, and I've got the usual culprits there. And I'm gonna present the answers as a table with the headings, the name of the AI tool, the version, and the number of parameters. So let's try running that and see if it takes as long as the previous prompt I typed in. So you can see that for this query, it thought for four minutes, 53 seconds, an improvement, I guess. I must stop asking such very expensive queries. So you can see that for most of the tools, the number of parameters isn't shown. For DeepSeek, it's 671B, 
whatever B is, we'll find that out in a second. This strand is 123B. So what I then did is asked it uh, what units is a B. And in this context, B means a billion parameters. So when it says Mistral is described as a 123B mo model, it means it has 123 billion trainable parameters. Now there's two problems with this. One is you can't see the number of parameters anymore for the other, other AI tools. They used to publish them. They clearly regard that information as confidential now. But the other problem is just because you have more parameters doesn't necessarily mean you'll get better results. It's all about how you use them. So that was a little interesting bit of background information. Perhaps not that useful. For the last two parts of this tutorial, let's have a look at temperature and the top P value. So beginning with temperature, let's suppose you ask a question, why is our training provide and leave a pause? Here's some possible ways you might complete this sentence using predictive text. 38.3% of people or AI tools might say computer training. 23.9% might say training and consultancy. And you might get classes in Microsoft software, a really good free good free pen, or business to business computer training in the UK. Depressingly, 0.4% might say a textbook example of how not to run a company. If you run this prompt with minimum temperature, which I think is zero, then what will happen is it will always take the most likely response. And this sort of prompt is deterministic. It's accurate, but it's not particularly creative. At the opposite end of the scale, you could set the temperature to maximum, which I believe is two, but again, I'm not sure of the actual thresholds. They're quite hard to find. And in this case, what will happen is all of the answers will be equally likely, even though they have different probability. So things which signify a prompt asked with maximum temperature is it's going to be more random, more creative, and more prone to hallucination. So to see an example of this in ChatGPT, or at least to try to see an example, let's suppose I ask it to write a light-hearted and humorous short story of not more than 100 words, which begins with the line, I wasn't sure what to expect when I opened the door. So if I run that now and see what it gives me, and you can see it's come up with a fairly surreal story, but very good. So what I could do is say, what temperature did you use for this prompt? Because I want to know whether it's set it to its minimum, maximum threshold or somewhere in between. And what it will do is unhelpfully tell me that it won't reveal its temperature. But what it does say is that my generation, that's of its story, lean towards a higher creativity setting. So let's say it's saying, would you like me to regenerate the story in a lower creativity style? So let's say yes, please, and see what it comes up with now. Just giving you a chance to read the story. I won't read it out to you. What I get is a less surreal and I think more boring story. So that's what temperature is. I've read a lot about it on the internet and I have to say my conclusion as with so many things is it really doesn't matter what temperature you choose. And the best thing to do is just accept whatever the AI tool gives you in its responses. Along with temperature, there's a concept called top P sampling. And using our same example, here's how this works. Supposing you set the top P level to 0.75, what it will do is sum the probabilities of the top most likely answers until they reach or exceed that threshold. So you can see if you sum the first three answers probabilities together, that comes to 81.8%. So I've reached my top P value. And what it will do is generate an answer which is equally likely to be any one of those top three answers. Should you care about this? I think probably emphatically not. This is very much for the sake of completeness. So what I could do is in chat GPT, I could say what tip, top P value do you use for queries like this typically, going on with my same short story idea. And I suspect it's not going to be very forthcoming. And I was right. I don't expose or tune raw generation parameters like top P. And then it gives me a bit of information about how they work in practice. There's so much more on our website at wiseowl.co.uk, including blogs, shorter tips, tutorials on SQL and VBA, hundreds of exercises in all sorts of different software applications, and a chance to test your skills in a few selected software applications. In addition to all of that, you can watch our video tutorials like this one in all these different subjects. 
or you could consider booking one of our training courses. Whether it be classroom, on site, or online, or even as one-to-one -one consultancy. Thank you for watching.